flash of light, and I realize I can hear the rain pouring down. It's a storm, lightning. I'm on the floor. With difficulty, I manage to lift my head and raise myself onto one elbow. He's sitting at the kitchen table, looking out at the storm, a beer bottle between his hands. Have you seen a speed drop lately? Well, you're about to. It's up ahead. He sees me raise my head. What choice are you giving me? He gets to his feet, comes over to me and holds out his hands. Come on, Rich. Grab hold. Up you come. I let him pull me to my feet. He's standing in front of me, against me. His hips pressing against mine. He wipes the tears off my cheekbones with his thumb. What am I supposed to do with you, Rich? You don't have to do anything. I try to smile. You know that I love you. I still do. You know I wouldn't tell anyone. I couldn't do that to you. He slips his hand around my waist. I press my hips against his. I can feel him getting hard. I slip my hand into the drawer behind me. And my right hand closes around a familiar object. I smile and lean into him, sneaking my left hand around his waist. Then I lunge forward, pressing all my weight against him throwing him off balance, though he stumbles back against the kitchen table. I raise my foot and stamp down on his as hard as I can, and as he pitches forward in pain, I grab a fistful of hair at the back of his head and pull him towards me, while at the same time driving my knee up into his face. He cries out. I push him to the floor, grab the keys from the kitchen table, and am out of the French doors before he's able to get to his knees. I head for the fence, but I slip in the mud and lose my footing and he's on top of me before I get there, dragging me backwards, pulling my hair, clawing at my face, spitting curses through blood. I get away from him again and run to the bottom of the garden, down towards the tracks. Dead end. I stand on the spot where a year or more ago I stood with his child in my arms. I turn, my back to the fence, and watch him striding purposefully towards me. He wipes his mouth with his forearm, spitting blood to the ground. I can feel vibrations from the tracks and the fence behind me. The train is almost upon us. It sounds like a scream. Tom's lips are moving. He's saying something to me, but I can't hear him. I watch him come. I watch him. And I don't move until he's almost upon me. And then I swing. I jam the vicious twist of the corkscrew into his neck. He raises his hands to his throat, his eyes on mine and he falls without a sound. I watch until I can't look any longer. Then I turn my back on him. As the train goes past, I can see faces in the brightly lit windows, travelers warm and safe on their way home. I try not to think about what came after. I try and I fail. Side by side, drenched in his blood, we sat on the sofa, Anna and I. The wives waiting for the ambulance. Anna called them. She called the police. She took care of everything. The paramedics arrived, too late for Tom, and on their heels came uniform police. Then the detectives, Gaskell and Riley. Their mouths literally fell open when they saw us. They asked questions, but I could barely move. Anna spoke, calm and assured. It was self-defense. I saw the whole thing from the window. He went for her with a corkscrew. He would have killed her. She had no choice. I tried to stop the bleeding, but I couldn't. I couldn't. When I turned back to watch him die, the train had passed. I heard a noise behind me and saw Anna coming out of the house. She walked quickly towards us and reaching his side, she fell to her knees and put her hands on his throat. I wanted to say, it's no good, you won't be able to help him now. But then I realized she wasn't trying to stop the bleeding. She was making sure, twisting the corkscrew in further and further. And all the time she was talking to him, softly, softly. I couldn't hear what she was saying. The last time I saw her was in the police station. 
when they took us to give our statements. She was led to one room and I to another. But just before we parted, she touched my arm. You take care of yourself, Rachel. It felt like a warning. We're tied together, forever bound by the stories we told. That I had no choice but to stab him. That Anna tried her best to save him. Eventually, I suppose, the nightmares will stop. But right now, I know there's a long night ahead. And I have to get up early tomorrow morning. To catch the train. The Girl on the Train was written by Paula Hawkins, abridged by Neville Teller, and read by Sally Hawkins, Lindsay Marshall, and Zoe Tapper. It was produced by Jenny Thompson news here on Radio 4. A good read. BBC Radio 4 investigates the risks of working while everyone else is asleep. The assumption has always been that you adapt to the night shift. You know, the body clock will map on to the demands of working at night. And the really extraordinary findings across a whole range of different studies is that you don't adapt. But how are our bodies affected by shift work? So what, you work 10 years on shifts and your brain ages by six and a half years. An additional six and a half years, yes. The night shift.